Okay, I would like to do a series on thinking in systems. And this book is by Donna Meadows, and it's really, really useful. So I'm actually going to at least start by going chapter by chapter, just sort of explaining the details in the chapter. And of course, I'm an economist, so I'm going to comment on her way of thinking from an economist's point of view. But these are just great tools and great vocabulary and great ways of running thought experiments and structuring your thought for any field, really. Now, of course, the first question is, what is a system? And she defines a system as having three, three things, elements, connectors, and purposes. But we might want to have some different examples in our head as we think this through. So as an economist, I'm thinking about the healthcare system and the legal system, but systems can include uh, physical things like the digestive system. Systems include the school system, the economic system. Um, obviously, the economic versions are the ones that, that bubble up to the top of my mind, but there's lots of different types of systems. And systems have parts, where, which are the elements, the different pieces that if you sort of took a snap snapshot of the system and tried to diagram the snapshot, what are the things that are in that system at that moment? And then systems have connectors which sort of connect between the parts and create relationships between the parts that can be dynamic. And then of course systems have a purpose. Now this one is actually interesting in her book because she says sometimes the stated purpose is not the real purpose of the system. The, the purpose of the system is what it does or what it accomplishes. So let me just fill out this table with some examples of each. So here are some examples. We've got elements of the school system includes teachers. The salary structure might sort of uh, create a relationship between, say, teachers and administrators and their contracts. So this is actually one point I wanted to make as an economist, which is when I first saw her structure and the way she was breaking this down, my first question was, where are the incentives in this, in this framework? And the incentives are really the connectors. They're sort of what creates relationships between the parts. Uh, the incentives are basically what creates dynamic movement within the system. And the purpose of an education system or of a school system might be education. For the legal system, we might have laws are one element of that system. Of course, there's many, many elements of a system that complex. Legal review, for example, the process that lawyers go through when they try to enact the laws where they might compare and pull from different laws and review precedent, all of that might be a connector within the system that could create a dynamic effect. And then purposes might be, one purpose of the legal system might be to contain crime. Um, the digestive system, we might have the stomach is one element, the large intestine, small intestine. Um, body signals might be a connector between the different systems. Is your stomach upset? And of course, body signals can be driven by chemicals and by the nervous system. And chemicals actually could be an element as well as a connector in some ways. And then um, the purpose of that system might be nourishing your body in some way, keeping you alive. And then, of course, the healthcare system, which I study. Um, one element of a healthcare system is insurance companies, and of course, contracts between insurance companies and doctors, and contracts between uh, patients and insurance companies. Those contracts connect the different parts the doctors, the patients, the, uh, the drug companies, all of that are connected through contracts. And what is the purpose of the healthcare system? Well, when I teach this, of course, I, I sort of teach the triple aim, which is what should be the purpose of a healthcare system, and this is where I get at uh, some deviation between the stated purpose and the actual purpose that it's accomplishing, which is that um, uh, in healthcare econ class, the, the triple aim is uh, basically says healthcare systems should aim to uh, have high population health, uh, 
uh, contain cost per capita so that the system is sustainable. I would actually prefer if this one were sustainability as opposed to cost per capita, but this is the official triple aim. And then patient satisfaction or something like patient experience. So the healthcare system says these are the goals, or at least healthcare administrators learn that these are the goals. But you might look at any given one of them and say actually um, the healthcare system is perhaps not accomplishing one or two of these goals, maybe even, maybe even three, and instead it's accomplishing something else, such as making itself larger. That's actually one of the problems in a lot of systems is that they have a stated purpose, which is uh, pro-social in some way, and their purpose instead becomes to, to become bigger and bigger as a system, which serves the people at the top who sort of want to increase their power. So that's one, uh, that's one uh, just point that, that connects with something in her first chapter. Now I'd like to read a couple of quotes from this chapter because uh, I thought these were just really insightful. So one thing she says is a system is more than the sum of its parts. It's this dynamic interaction between the parts to accomplish something. She says, systems can be self-organizing and are often self-repairing over at least some range of disruptions. And of course, the immune system in our bodies is very self-repairing. We know that when we get cut, it may take a couple of weeks, but that's going to heal through the systems in the body that sort of send signals that you need white blood cells or whatnot to go to that that site. And the same is true of some economic systems that there are some natural forces that lead to stability, that lead to self-maintenance of the system. Another great quote from that first chapter is, many of the interconnections operate through the flow of information. So oftentimes the connectors are information-based. And one of the reasons this is important for economists is that we're in an information-based economy. Information is where so much of the resources of society are being channeled. And that includes information about how to improve your business, it includes information about healthcare, information about how to live your lives. There's so much information out there. That's sort of the focus of the economy at the moment. And so um, it's kind of acknowledging that the connectors are often the most powerful parts of a system. And this is another point she makes, is that oftentimes when we think of a system, our minds will gravitate toward the elements. Because the elements are easy to visualize, they're sort of like, if we're visualizing a system, we're thinking about a snapshot of it. But she says, actually, what matters more in terms of what the purpose ends up being is oftentimes the connectors between the different parts, more so than the parts itself. And she makes the point that if you change out all of the parts, like if you uh, replace every member of a basketball team with a different person, that actually doesn't change the system as much as changing, say, the rules of the game. Changing the rules of the basketball game would completely change the system. Changing the players changes it a little bit, but not as much. Okay, she uses these diagrams to help us sort of think about the dynamics of a system. And the simplest is going to be the bathtub example that she brings up, where stock is the snapshot in time of what the system looks like with no dynamics. And then these arrows represent the dynamics that are changing and that are working within the system to sort of do whatever. And so um, if the stock of a bathtub is how full the bathtub is with water, then the inflow might be the faucet and the outflow might be the drain and um, the, the stock at any given moment in time is going to be a function of the previous inflow and previous outflow. And she makes the point that a lot of times you can't change the stock of a system immediately. Um, you can't just like snap your fingers and get rid of all the water in the bathtub. You need to sort of let this fl outflow process happen if you wanted to get rid of that. And a lot of times when people think about systems, they may be thinking about, okay, we need to change the system now, but there may be elements that take time to actually work through, uh, work through different types of change. And of course, stock and flow are used in the field of economics as well. Another cool thing she talks about in the chapter is the feedback loop, 
where um, she'll represent the feedback loop with these arrows where there's sort of this circular motion. This leads to this, leads to this, leads to this. And she talks about these two types of feedback loops where balancing feedback loops sort of bring the system back into equilibrium and reinforcing feedback loops uh, set the system sort of out of equilibrium in a spiraling kind of mode. Now, I love her example of a balancing feedback loop, which was uh, basically your budget and the amount of money you have in your bank account. Where the stock here, of course, is money in your bank account, the inflow is your income every month, the outflow is your spending every month. And if you have a situation where the stock um, of, of money in your bank account is less than you would like it to be. That's a discrepancy between your goals and uh, what's actually happening in your bank account. Then that's going to lead you to change your outflow, to spend less money, and that is in turn going to influence the stock. So the budgeting every month or checking your, your bank account every month is a little mini balancing feedback loop that people have. And my favorite example of the reinforcing feedback loop was her and her brother getting into fights when they were kids where um, the, the stock might be uh, amount of goodwill between the brother and sister and if the brother started poking at the sister and trying to annoy her, she would react by trying to poke at him even more, by trying to beat him at the poking back, and then he would react to that by poking back even more, and it led to this uh, escalating feedback loop spiral where they just got into more and more of a fight until something dissipated that. So that, that's a fun example of a reinforcing feedback loop from her from her chapter. I think that's all I will say on this for now. Basically, uh, systems thinking is super useful for complex systems. I think economists should all read this book because it adds this extra layer to our thinking, which I think is very helpful.